and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. I'm delighted to have two guests with me today. Father Joseph Fessio, who was uh, a doctoral student under Benedict XVI when the future Pope was known as Joseph Ratzinger, a professor and priest at the University of Regensburg in Germany. Father Fessio taught philosophy and theology at Gonzaga University, the University of Santa Clara, and at the University of San Francisco. He also served as chancellor at Ave Maria University. In 1978, he founded Ignatius Press, a major Catholic publisher that has brought out most of the English translations of the works of Cardinal Ratzinger and later Benedict XVI. He's also the publisher of the Catholic World Report. Robert Royal is the founder and president of Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, DC, and editor in chief of The Catholic Thing, a publication he founded with Michael Novak in 2008. Dr. Royal holds a BA and an MA from Brown University and a PhD from the Catholic University of America. The author of many books, the, his most recent ones include Columbus and the Crisis of the West and A Deeper Vision, the Catholic Intellectual Tradition in the 20th Century. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. We have a very large topic today. It's the legacy of Benedict XVI, who died at the age of 95 recently and who served as Pope from 2005 to 2013. Let's first of all address his principal achievements and then see which of those might constitute his legacy. Father Fessio, since you knew the Pope so well, since you studied under him, how would you answer that first part of the question? Well, of course, uh, he was an extraordinary teacher and uh, students would flock to his classes. I was fortunate to be a doctoral student only because his friend, Father de Lubac, recommended me. So there's, there's an achievement for certain as a teacher. He did not want to be a bishop or archbishop. He was made the Archbishop of Munich Freising. Uh, he accepted that because he believed it, well, because the Pope asked him to accept it. And he wasn't there for long. It was a huge administrative burden. The Archdiocese of Munich Freising has something like 5,000 employees or more. It's, it's, it's incredible. But then he went to Rome to be the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. And there, of course, for more than 20 years, uh, he was at the side of John Paul II and many achievements in, in both promoting right doctrine, orthodoxy, and also protecting and defending against errors. And in 19, between 85 and 1991 and 1992, he was tasked by Pope John Paul II to oversee the writing and editing of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And that, of course, is a monumental achievement, which is still there for us. He was also, of course, at the Second Vatican Council as a priest with Carl Frings. And he was instrumental, actually, in having the initial schemata, the outlines, that's Greek, outlines for the different documents changed and uh, redrafted, and particularly the one on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, that's Latin for word of God. And uh, so that's an achievement. He had many other things. He, he played the piano beautifully, that's an achievement. He, he loved art and literature. Uh, and then of course, as Pope, many things he did. Uh, he tried to bring reconciliation within the Catholic Church between people who are fighting about the different forms of the Mass. He gave some lectures which are, I think, world-changing lectures, particularly on September 12th in 2006, the Regensburg Lecture. Uh, but I, I could fill up the rest of your show, Bob, with achievements. I mean, the man was 95 years old when he died, and he was a a tremendous, you know, the energetic in a certain way intellectually. So there's just there's so much there. Well, I understand he wrote some 86 books. 
which is astonishing by itself. And some say, simply in the written word, he compares with St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas. Yes. In fact, today I was on uh, uh, Raymond Arroyo's show, The World Over, and Carl Miller referred to him as, I'm sorry, this is Latin, but Augustine, Augustinus Re de Vivus. Augustine returned, you know. But it's interesting, Bob, he, he didn't write very many books, actually. What he wrote were articles and essays. He gave homilies. He gave radio talks. And often they were planned to be uh, on, a, on a common theme. And then these were later made into books. His first book, and that is basically the lectures he gave at Tübingen in 1968, 1969. Then at the end of his life, he did write a book, three volumes, Jesus of Nazareth. And in the middle, he wrote The Spirit of Liturgy. He also wrote a small autobiography, Milestones in English. But otherwise, most of his writings are you know, long interviews with Victoria Missouri or Peter Zabal, or as I say, homilies or essays. Yeah, I just recently read um, a book that was put out of four sermons he gave, or which were later refined and worked on some more, <clears throat> back in about 1986, which is called In the Beginning and is a utterly brilliant explication of Genesis. I would also simply remark, uh, since you included the subject of music, that uh, I didn't read anyone who had a profounder insight into the nature and character of music, by which he meant classical music, and how at its height, it makes the transcendent perceptible. Uh, very moving writings on that subject. Well, Bob Royal, let's turn to you for an answer about the nature of his achievements. Father Fessio, some of what you talked about was inside baseball in the Catholic Church, but he certainly could speak of achievements that were, let's say, more universal. And one being, though we don't have to address that at this moment, was the dialogue in which he engaged with fellow Christians of other denominations and uh, with Islam. And, and with Judaism. And with, and with well, most important, yeah, very importantly, with Judaism, and with Enlightenment scientism or you know empiricism, he had a dialogue there as well, and with Marxists. So, but Bob, you... yeah, Bob. Uh, uh, since uh, Father Fessio has done the the Catholic thing, so to speak, uh, rather extensively, I'll talk a little bit about what I think are kind of his. Um, his impact in various secular realms. For example, back in the 80s, when liberation theology was a big deal in uh, Latin America, and he, even the present Pope, Pope Francis, has been tinged somewhat by that kind of Christianity cum Marxism. Um, he, he was instrumental in bringing out two documents in the Catholic Church, one which was a critique of Marxism in all its forms, because throughout his works, when he's he's addressing sort of the secular world, he's clear that if there isn't a God term out there, we're going to find another God term. A real God, we're going to find another God. And Marxism, for a lot of people, became that air science God. So he, he was such a, a brilliant philosophical, theological, cultural mind that it was, ex it was extremely important back in the 1980s, the way he was able to parse out what was wrong with a, a kind of a Marxist version of liberation theology. And that had an enormous impact kind of actually put an end to it between him, his influence and, and John Paul's in any kind of really potent form. He then went on to talk about what real liberation would be, which is liberty, uh, which is a liberty that is brought about by truth. Not only did he he worry about scientism and worry about Marxism, he worried about positivism. And he actually spoke to the German Bundestag after he became Pope and said to them, look, the thing that got us into hot water in Germany, at least on, at a purely legalistic level, was the kind of positivism that, as many have pointed out, Hans Kelsen proposed, that you, you, know, you have democratic procedures by which you arrive at laws, but what if those laws turn evil? What if the men and women administering those laws are evil? There has to be a higher truth, a higher goodness, 
uh, a different kind of humanism that can be a critique of even democratic systems that that go wrong. So I think in a variety of ways, um, he actually said when he spoke to the Bundestag, it, the reason why positivism is so bad in addition to the, the fact that it can lead to things like Marxism is that we limit ourselves as human beings. We limit human reason. And we're like in a bunker of our own creation, he says. It can be very, very well uh, air-conditioned and, and lit and, and furnished with foods and whatnot. But it's not the fullness of human life. So I think that on that more secular side, he and he was able to speak about this stuff to places like the Bundestag. To, he spoke at, at Westminster in England. He spoke in Paris. Um, there was a real cultural uh, uh, influence that he had in Europe that was a reflection of this very deep mind that he had, but that he was also able to convey in a way that was accessible even God help us, even to polit politicians in a variety of countries. Well, yes, he, I mean, he, he wrote several articles which became books on Europe, Turning Point for Europe. He wrote that book, Marcel Pera, the, who was president of Italy at the time. Uh, he gave a talk at the same time as uh, Habermas did at the Bergen Academy. So you're right, Bob. He, 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 he had a direct influence on secular culture by engaging with it, even his first encyclical. You know, and usually in encyclical, like you say, uh, the other Bob here, uh, Riley, it's uh, inside baseball things. But his first encyclical, instead of quoting other popes, instead of quoting Augustine right away, he quoted Plato and Aristotle and Freud and Nietzsche and he, he, on the subject of love. So that's something which is important outside the Catholic Church and the secular order. And he also, when he before he was pope at the at the congregation, he made many statements on human dignity, on life, death, birth, uh, marriage, that are of value for everyone. They're not simply Catholic teachings; they're part of the structure of the world, structure of creation, so-called natural law. I think one of his other great achievements, Bob, was an attempt to point out to people inside the church, how important the Greek philosophical tradition was. That, that famous lecture that we've mentioned already, the Regensburg Address that he gave, he talked about there being three de-Hellenizations even within the church, that at the time of the Reformation with Luther, uh, sola fide was you know, this sort of blind faith that can lead on the one hand to uh, a, a kind of a extremism, the, the kind of extremism that sometimes we see in Islam, um, without that corrective of, of reason. He said that the same thing happened in the 19th century when a kind of enlightenment uh, rationality narrowed things down. And it, that rationality was not reason. And then he also said in, in our, our time that the idea of multiculturalism, that the, the various cultures of the world are just relative to one another, this too kind of abandons the, 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 great, the three great currents that exist in our Western culture, namely the biblical current that gives us that kind of metaphysical depth, the, the uh, philosophical tradition in Greece, and of course the legal tradition of Rome that, that was so important in the development of the West. So he was um, he was an important figure uh, inside the church for that, that kind of correction, but this also of co course continues to have uh, all kinds of repercussions, and he pointed out that there's no civilization that can defend itself unless it has some kind of sense of the transcendent. And for, for Europe and for us in the United States, and of course in many other places, um, God is that transcendence. That, that transcendence is what actually limits the political and keeps the polit political from turning into a kind of a metastasizing uh, uh, lust for power, libido dominandi, if I can invoke a little bit of Latin uh, along with, um, with, uh, with Father Fessia. He's an enormous figure, and I think we're just starting to appreciate um, not only what he was able to achieve in his own day, but the, the continuing relevance of the, the, the deep thought presented in a way that was quite accessible to a lot of people. Well, yes, and Bob, uh, the other Bob here, Bob Riley, wrote a book which we published in Nation's Press called America on Trial. And Bob Riley spent the first several chapters explaining that our Constitution was not out of nowhere, and it wasn't out of Hobbes either, but it comes from the tradition that goes back exactly what you said, Bob Royal, Jerusalem, Athens, Rome. That's the tripod. That's the triad. And, you know, Bob Riley, you, you 
expressed that, defended that, and showed how important it was for our Constitution not to forget those origins. Well, Benedict was doing the same thing. He was defending Jerusalem and Athens and Rome in the secular world. In fact, one of the, the in, in this book we just published as a memorial, there's one section on faith and reason. And he was the perfect example of, of faith, which you might consider inside baseball, defending reason, which is the whole park, you know, the whole building, the whole city. And it, it, it's strange that w when you lose faith, you also lose your mind. Uh, that's not me, that's Chesterton, but uh, it's true. And I, I think that was at the core of his legacy and his achievement with respect to the wider world, exactly what Bob Roy was saying, but a defense of the roots of Western civilization and of Europe. He did uh, speak of the United States favorably in this sense. He suggested that we had these breakwaters against these forces of relativism in our founding documents and the principles which animated them. And he specifically referred to the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and so forth. But he used a famous phrase that resonated throughout the world, particularly in the West, that he said endangers this because it erodes the primacy of reason to what you were speaking, Father Fessio, uh, as well as the grounds of faith. And that famous phrase was the tyranny of relativism. Yes. I'm sure you remember the event on the White House lawn when Benedict came to the United States. And you had Benedict speaking like a president of the United States and Bush speaking like a pope. I mean, <laughs> they, they, were, they were both expressing the, the deepest ideals and principles of the other. But you, you saw the beautiful interrelationship there between faith and culture. Yeah, you know, it's curious. I, Bob, you've, uh, of course, explored the, the natural law foundations, to use that term, of uh, of our Constitution. And, you know, beginning in, in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Uh, Benedict actually pointed out to Europeans, because they, they don't have quite, I think, quite as clear a tradition of this, and it's certainly, I don't think it's instituted in, in um, the structures of the EU. He pointed out that today when people talk about that natural law tradition, they think it's kind of a Catholic thing and it's sectarian and it's just, you know, it's not something that people in, in developed uh, democratic societies ought to pay attention to. And he says, oh, no, no, wait a minute. The natural law tradition begins back with the Stoics and the Greeks. It begins, it, it, it gets developed with a great a Latin figure like Cicero. I mean, we anybody who looks into the history of philosophy and, and Western thought knows that 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 understanding that nature and and what re reason, real reason, that it tries to deep, dig deeply into the nature of things and the nature of human beings, that's where our natural law tradition comes out of. And so when we say that we hold these truths to be self evident, well, they may not be self evident in 2023, and maybe they weren't even. Um, for, for very long after the founding of the United States. Well, okay. And anyway, the, the way that this comes to a head is simply that almost every civilization, even the ones that are, are not connected with the West, has some kind of idea of the foundation of things being meaningful. We say in, in, in the Christian tradition, the logos, the logic, the reason, the, the intelligibility of things that, re, that come directly from an intelligible God. And so putting that on the table in front of the Bundestag or in Paris or in Rome or, you know, in various other places, reaffirming it when he was here in the United States. This is a fundamental thing, not only for the church, although it, there are lots of people in the Catholic church who don't understand this any longer, but also for our public life. And, and if, we, if we read him, you know, understanding that the questions that we're raising now, he says at one point in one of his books, you know, once God disappears, all you have are these big words that can be abused in a variety of ways, democracy, you know, um, just anti-discrimination. He even says at one point, we start to see it in the Western world, that the term anti-discrimination is actually being used to discriminate against other points of view and not extending freedom, but restricting it. Well, of course, he had the experience of growing up under Nazi Germany. And pertaining to the point you just made, Bob, he he described the regime as sinister, 
I'm quoting him now, one that banished God and thus imper and thus became impervious to anything true and good. He extended that critique, as you've just pointed out, making the primacy of reason central, but reason is understood as an expression of the logos, that is, of God as reason, to which he always referred as in explicating the beginning of the the uh, Gospel of St. John. And, and this seemed to undergird his insistence in any dialogue, including his insistence with uh, of this point in dialogue with Islam. You don't end up agreeing on the integrity of reason. You begin with the integrity of reason as the foundation of the dialogue. And what's more, uh, with the agreement that that reason reveals the inviolable integrity of every individual person as coming from God, which is the source of freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. What impressed me about his dialogues with uh, Muslims is, again, he didn't set that as a goal to be reached through the dialogue, <clears throat> but as a necessary precondition for even beginning it. Yeah, how can you have dialogue, which is to say there's going to be an in interchange of two people trying to reason together if you deny it at the beginning that there is truth available to the, via the logos? I mean, what, what you then would be saying is there's your truth and my truth, as the kids say these days. And then dialogue becomes not only impossible, but it, 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 it inevitably becomes a clash because if your truth is not going to be accessible to a discussion with my truth, then we're, we're just expressing ourselves as two distinct and possibly opposed, most likely opposed um, people who are confronting one. Once reason is sidelined, what's left is will. And therefore, if your truth and my truth are different and I feel imposed upon by your truth, well, I'm going to impose mine on you, or at least eliminate you. I'm going to cancel your truth. Well, that's what was so impressive about his uh, term, the tyranny of relativism, that what you just described, Father Fessio, can take place through democratic forms. Right. When those democratic societies uh, or forms of government uh, lose that link to the transcendent, which is this, the source of the rights which they're supposed to be protecting in the first place. And then as Bob Will said earlier, <laughs> I think he said, maybe you said it, Bob, that law becomes merely positive law. And when it's positive law, how can you judge whether law is good or bad? If the origin of law is a democratic process where you rights are created and then offered to people, there's no way of criticizing any law from any higher viewpoint. And that's, again, what Rasha was continually harping upon when he gave, gave these talks to, you know, the, like you say, the Bundestag or the British Parliament, is that you can judge laws. There can be such a thing as a good law or a bad law, but only if there's a standard which is not the law itself. Yeah, you know, Ratzinger said several times that de democracy and the kind of laws and, and, and uh, policies and procedures that democracies establish for many things can be handled by the, you know, the usual democratic process. There are majorities, there are minorities, and you 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 work through uh, working together to try to arrive at a way to, to go forward. But when it comes to those fundamental things, I've been in debate, as I think probably all of us have with people in, in the United States, about where do our rights come from? Or why, why do I think that you, as a different person than me, have, have dignity? Why do I have to respect you? Well, it's pretty darn hard to figure out why we respect one another, why we think every individual human being on the face of the planet, from the child in the womb to the elderly person who's on the, on the, the, uh, the edge of death, why are all these people bearers of dignity? Why do I does why do I owe respect and and the recognition of their dignity to them? Outside of being created in the image and likeness of God, I don't know what we can say. We can't say that that biology or Darwinism gives us inherent dignity. We can't say that 
that um, happening to be an American or a, 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 a Frenchman or an Italian gives us dignity. It, it's only in that deepest sense of the way that we've been created in the image and the likeness that stands over and above all those systems that can abuse us. It's, it's extremely interesting about the point you just made because the uniqueness of uh, revelation to the Jews was precisely that point in Genesis that man is made in the image and likeness of God, uh, which was not heard in the surrounding cultures in the Middle East, uh, whether they're Sumerian, Akkadian, and so forth, uh, in, in their versions of a cosmogony, um, the, the human beings were created to be slaves of the gods and weren't made in the image and likeness of God, which sort of sets a foundation for addressing the question of cultural relativism, that indeed they're not all relative. And, and that's, that's also a significant point for the kinds of dialogues that uh, Benedict XVI was pursuing, there are cultures today that don't accept uh, that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Part well, of you, you, you're, you're an expert on Islam to some extent. What would you say is the Islamic view of that? The term they'd use is shirk, blasphemy, to associate God with man is is a form of blasphemy because uh, he he can't be associated with anything, and he's decidedly not made in uh, the image and likeness of Allah. Well, it always struck me. Well, always as soon as I learned about it, that you know there's a great reverence for God in these Islamic philosophy, theology, religion, and there's 99 names for God. But among those 99 names are missing father and love because you, you can't have fatherhood or genuine love without a community of persons. And, and only the Trinity can ultimately found uh, a view where God can be distinct from us and yet we can have value as more than just his slaves. Well, that's a very good point because... Uh... All my points are very good points. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't make it. What Islam specifically is in relationship to Christianity is a denial of the incarnation of Christ and a denial of the Trinity. And the, uh, the oldest written words we have from Islam are around the base of the dome of the rock. And those specifically say, I have no associates. They're you know, repeatedly saying there's, there's no incarnation, there's no trinity. And that's why Islam is scandalized by Christianity. And as you mentioned, Father Fessio, to call God our father, uh, the prayer that Jesus Christ said, uh, taught his apostles to pray, our father. To suggest there's a familial relationship between man and God is another shocker. Now, I don't mean uh, in my general characterizations of Islam here to exclude a very beautiful spirituality that obtains in parts of Islam and a profoundly moving mysticism that was uh, exactly uh, influenced by Christian mystics in the in the Middle East. So it's a variegated uh, religion. You can't say it's all one thing. It's, it's a different thing in Indonesia where you find the principal and largest Muslim organization in the world, not let to ulama, accepting the equality of all people and a detoxified uh, Islam that is precisely against the uh, form of it uh, that was so toxic until recently in Saudi Arabia. And also what, what it allows within itself is philosophy. In other words, it accepts the status of reason to which Benedict XVI spoke so powerfully. So there's a part of the Islam world it's not that these issues still aren't contentious within Indonesia, they are, but 
there is a sign a side which accepts that integrity of reason and also then forms the the basis for true dialogue well look, this may sound like it's a bit off the thread but it's something which benedict and john paul ii defended uh, greatly but do you think that the separation of church and state, which I would say goes back to Jesus is saying, render the Caesar the things that are Caesar, the God the things that are God's, an enigmatic saying, but nevertheless, one which planted the seeds seems to me for the, for the separation or distinction of church and state. Do you think that the lack of a Trinitarian theology is somehow responsible for the inability of Islam to have a state and a religion that are distinct? It's very interesting because Benedict XVI spoke of uh, secularism as a gift of Christianity. Yes. Uh, that that it's, um, it, made, it made the state possible by more or less defining its limits that a, a state could no longer assume theocratic pretensions. And Within Islam, of course, for many, many centuries, uh, that presented a problem. It, it is, I think, most a problem to, today in those forms of Islam that we refer to, perhaps not, not entirely accurately as uh, radical Islam or Islamism. That problem exists intellectually and philosophically and theologically within Islam. And it's one of the things that's being addressed. There was a, a Muslim philosopher in Morocco, interestingly enough, who made the statement, the future of Islam will be Aristotelian or it will not be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was in Turkey some years ago and talking with a woman who may someday be the prime minister of Turkey. And I quoted that passage, Father, that you just quoted about uh, render uh, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And she looked at me and she said, is that in the Gospels? She had no idea. Uh, I mean, e e either you, what you're going to have is the kind of situation that exists in Turkey where there's kind of a forced separation of the two and there's a kind of an un uneasiness about having the secular state on the one hand and then you know, the religious belief on the other hand, or there's gotta be some sort of conversation, some sort of dialogue that goes on within Islam itself. And that requires cultivating the kind of uses of reason that are gonna enable even Muslims themselves to be able to discuss it. So Bob, I'm not at all surprised that this Moroccan uh, talked about Aristotle. You know, we, we've got the problem internally in the West that, that, uh, that Benedict talked about, that we're a, a virtually a cultureless uh, civilization now, that we've suppressed the, 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 our own deep deep roots in the ways that we talked about earlier in Greece and, and uh, Jerusalem and Athens and, and uh, Rome. So um, we've got that same kind of problem that we've got. We've got to work on the way that uh, reason is going to is going to um, conduct that dialogue between our more secular side, because there is a more secular side, even in Christianity, there's a more secular side of of uh, what our lives are, and that absolute um, religious side, that holy side. Uh, and there's nothing other than the the conversation between faith and reason that is going to be able to resolve such such massive questions. And that was the real intent and scope of the Benedict speech in Regensburg, it wasn't primarily a critique of Islam or the East, although it was that, saying to them they needed their enlightenment, they had to give reason its, its proper place. But he also criticized the West, the secular West, for reducing knowledge to scientific and empirical knowledge with no openness to the transcendent. And, and he said, that will lead to the disintegration of the West. You published uh, one book of a series of talks that Benedict XVI gave. It's called Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, Western Culture. Yes. And yes. this again is Benedict addressing exactly that problem of what's happened inside Western culture that has become deracinated, it has been separated from its roots, by which he meant it's it's cut off the transcendent. If I just quote from one of these talks briefly, he reinforces the points that both of you were making 
He said, reason can no longer recognize anything but itself. And what is empirically certain is paralyzed and self-destructive. Reason that cuts itself off from God completely and tries to confine him to the purely subjective realm loses its bearings and thus opens the door to the forces of destruction. Right. And that, that's not an inside baseball statement. That's not no. a statement of faith. That's a statement of a man with a deep understanding of the real, of what is, as Father Shaw would say, you know? He used that phrase in the famous Regensburg lecture in criticizing the West, which, as you say, Father Fessio, was the major import of the talk. It wasn't about Islam. It was about the West, mainly. De-Hellenization. Let's talk about that, Bob. Yeah, well, we met, we touched on this before, and um, I would go further even and say that he he's trying to point back to the fact that history, history as we know it, is a, a, a creation of the Bible. Other cultures don't really pay attention. They don't think God works in history. We think he does. We think he did in the Old Testament, that as, as the stories of the Old Testament unroll. God is successively re revealing himself and, and helping the shape of people. And then ultimately, of course, he, re he reveals himself in Jesus Christ. But it's just true, as, as is true of any individual human being, that human civilizations, human cultures, if they lose contact with their roots, then they, they dry up. It's like pulling a tree out of the ground. It's going to dry up. And it's one of the, the important elements of the West that we have this connection to ancient Greece. And it's not, he says, the third form of dehellenization. It's not just that we now live in a multicultural world, but we still have to look back at the fact that that's where we came from. And if you believe God is active in history, as Christians, I, I think, have to, that you have to believe there's a reason why God came into the world at the point where Roman law had kind of pacified the Mediterranean and Greco-Roman culture, Hellenistic culture was the culture by which principles were going to be expressed. The, the New Testament is written in Greek. It's written in Koine Greek, just as the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. So if, if we lose contact with that, even with that linguistic fact, we're kind of denying that God himself is, is active in history. And then we've got this kind of Gnostic, you know, there's God in me, there's this pure spirituality. That is not the, the way that, that uh, Christianity and even Judaism think about the nature of the world. We're connected to our past. And just as a tree draws nourishment from the ground, we draw nourishment from where we came from because God intended us to come out of that context. I entirely agree with that. But I remember in high school thinking to myself, well, I'm a Catholic because my parents are Catholic, but there's other people's parents who are Muslim or, or Confucian or atheist or agnostic. So the fact that my personal roots were Catholic was not for me enough to say I should then remain a Catholic. I had to find out which of those roots, which of those cultures, which of those traditions seem to correspond to my experience of reality. And I, I, I do think we have to keep to our roots because what we're doing is we're respecting the wisdom of those who went before us. As Chesterton says, tradition is a democracy of the dead, that we, we give a vote, you know, to those who've gone before us. And, uh, uh, in, this is a little bit off, but a couple of years ago, making my retreat, I, I watched this series by Jordan Peterson on Genesis. Now, he was not at the time and still not, as far as I know, a, a, a practicing or professing Christian. But he talked about Genesis and Revelation and, and how the, the truths that came into Genesis rose up kind of in a, a, the fashion of, uh, yeah, Maybe archetype. But the way he expressed how how God worked in his people in this mysterious and somewhat blurry way and what kind of bubbled to the top and crystallized was what we have is the prophets and in the torah and so on uh but i do not think it is a uh, prejudiced thing to say that western civilization's roots are the only roots which can support a tree that will flourish completely. And as John Henry Newman, St. John Henry Newman said, he would say that Western civilization, civilization with a capital C, basically. 
I don't guess you canceled Robert Riley, but anyway, you can you can just say uh, uncontrollable guest. Benedict the Sixteenth. I forget whether it was in his talk to the Bundestag or elsewhere. Said that these these truths that we have received through our tradition that we're made in the image and likeness of God and therefore inviolable in our persons um, is also accessible through reason uh, by people outside of the Christian tradition. So <clears throat> once again, he was profoundly hopeful that that would serve as the basis of the dialogues he sought with Judaism, Islam, and within Christianity with Lutherans and other Protestant sects. And he, I think he thought that was the thing that was most imperiled in Europe and in the United States because of this determined effort to cut ourselves off from our own roots. And, and that, um, I'm trying to think of whether he probably spoke of the problems of some of the immigration in Europe that was threatening the integrity of that culture because the immigration was taking place within a context of that cultural relativism and therefore not uh, uh, requiring the kind of assimilation that would be necessary for having a coherent society. Well, sometimes people think that holding tradition being conservative is stifling. Uh, there's no room for creativity or for development or for change. And look at the history of music, which you know so well, Bob Riley. Could you imagine someone writing something truly valuable who had no knowledge of the history of music, who didn't know about chant, didn't know about polyphony, didn't know about you know the classical music, didn't know about all these movements? What it's tradition which allows for creativity. You don't have to invent the scale. And by the way, I mean, as I'm sure you know, the 12 tone scale is a, is a Western in, invention without which you cannot have harmony. The pentatonic scale or the other scales that they had outside the West will not emit harmony, only melody. Well, therefore, if you want to write a song that has melody to it, you have to remain in the tradition of the diet, the 12 tone scale that came from the West. So to me, that's a little, an image of how tradition is not stifling, is not a limitation. Well, it's a limitation in a sense, just like the notes on a keyboard are a limitation, as opposed to having, uh, you know, infinite number of notes. But Tradition is the only basis for genuine creativity, seems to me. Well, I, I think let, with what, what you're let saying... Me bounce, as a piano <laughs> player, let, let me of bounce off of... <laughs> the yeah. really man who begins <laughs> his day, every day playing Bach, you want to hear from Bach. Well, and, and, other, and other people, and other people as well. Look, yeah, this kind of polyphony, I mean, let's use that term, you know, whether there's multiple sound. Um, I'm kind of struck, and I think that there, there are tones that... that give this off in that Regensburg uh, address. That we forget that the dictatorship of re relativism that he talked about just before he became Pope is not only about relativism, it's about dictatorship, right? So if you want to talk about multiculturalism, you know, we're all into diversity and multiculturalism and whatnot. Western civilization by its very nature is multicultural. We've talked about Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, that there are at least three main currents. And then of course you have the, so-called barbarian tribes that play into this, and then Christianity moves on to other parts of the world and has to acculture, enculturate to be accepted in various places. So if you want diversity of culture, this is a tradition that already has, and one of the reasons it's able to adapt itself to all sorts of other circumstances, it already has a, a certain pluralism, a certain polyphony, a certain harmony within itself. The, the real diversity that we have comes from the fact that our tradition is, is already um, has multiple voices within it, and therefore it's able to look to the Middle East through the, the developments that occurred in Judaism. It's able to look at any culture that develops a kind of a rational philosophical basis on the basis of 
of um, what we know from Greece. It's able to, through Roman law and the way that Rome itself had to deal with a multicultural empire, um, we recognize that the rule of law, that, that to make law equal for all people of whatever background they are, however they came to be in our societies, is the th very thing that protects the dignity and the rights and the very lives of all of us. So, um, you know, I, I'm a strong supporter of the the, the uh, tradition of the West, which is not to say that it's closed off. It can go, it, it can develop further. It can, in its encounters with other, as Christianity has, learn things from, from the new peoples that it encounters. But I, I think we, one of the things that Bennett is quite brilliant about is, is how these terms like non-discrimination or multiculturalism or diversity have actually become quite the opposite of what they were understood to be in 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 uh, yeah. our tradition, and they are not liberating. They are actually reducing the the area of truth and of freedom. Bob, I think that point is uh, extremely pertinent. <clears throat> that this Western civilization, with its it, its roots, with uh, about which you've both spoken so eloquently, is open to other cultures, and the distinctive <laughs> thing about Many other cultures, it, it's that they are not open to anything outside themselves. So there, you have the foundation of a kind of universality. And going back to Father Fessio's point on music, that in a way is a perfect expression of the universality about which we've been speaking, because Western music is acknowledged in many diverse, diverse cultures in Japan, in China, in the Middle East. You find Western orchestras, string quartets, and a large appreciative audience for the great achievements of Western music, which found ways to exploit the full potential of tones of the octave. Uh, as Father Fessio said, I mean, the octave exists in, in the music of, of every culture. The difference is how the octave is divided. Right. We, we don't have tribal music. It's kind of universal in its, its, its address, in its musical speech to the human soul. And that's why I think people everywhere are so moved by it. Although, although today you're both probably aware that that very attractive feature about it is being denigrated as imperialism because everything has to be seen now through this sieve of neo-tribalism. Well, as Father Fessio said earlier, a reason disappears, what replaces it? It's will. And, and so you get this kind of neo-Marxist cultural reading of everything in which you don't have this mutual enrichment, to use another term that, that Benedict uses, where the, the old and the new, where different uh, types of cultures interact with one another and enrich one another. What you have are these stark oppositions. You have black versus white. You have men versus women. You have the West versus the rest. And I think this is quite dangerous. And, and this also comes under that umbrella, the general umbrella of the dictatorship of relativism, because it looks like it's seeking to be a liberalization and an openness. And in fact, what it is, is a openness to everything except our own culture. Now, you, you can, this is a complicated subject, of course, but when any culture begins to value other cultures without even having examined them very carefully, by the way, over its own, there's something wrong. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, uh, Bob, that I wrote a book about Columbus and the crisis of the West. Well, the West actually developed studies, the, the different disciplines like ethnology, uh, learned uh, foreign languages, actually explored different parts of the world because there was this expansiveness that came out of the Christian, out of Christian Europe, frankly. No other culture uh, expanded around the world and looked to find out what there was that was out there. And then when it found other peoples, actually studied their ways. Um, it developed different disciplines, anthropology, <laughs> ethnology, all those sorts of things, studied even for, foreign forms of music and, uh, and, and everything else. There's no other culture that's really done that the way that the West has. So it's simply a lie, or it's a, at least a historical blindness to claim that this that it's imperialism or colonialism only that drew, that drove the expansion of Western culture around the globe. It's actually curiosity on the part of the West 
and at least to a certain extent, a, a, a receptiveness in other parts of the globe about what we were able, we were able to achieve and able to transmit to other peoples. And also a generosity, obviously of mixed motives everywhere, but you know, I'm a Jesuit. My forefathers in the Society of Jesus came to North America in the 1600s, and they left a very cultured France to do so. And what did they do? They went into Heronia. They went where the Iroquois were. It wasn't, that's not domination. That's sharing the goods that you received yourself without merit to others who can benefit by them. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Benedict XVI was the greatest defender of reason in the 20th and 21st century. Would you accept that designation for him? Uh, I would say it's a close race between him and John Paul II. <laughs> Bob, you know, it's often a joke. Um, maybe some of our viewers won't have heard it, but if Voltaire were alive today, the great anti-Catholic French philosopher, if Voltaire were alive today, he would be shocked to find out that it's the Catholic Church that is a defender of reason in the world. Exactly. And it, it just occurred to me, uh, Bob, as an illustration of the point you were making, that perhaps the greatest defender of uh, reason in Western culture today is an African cardinal whose works, Father Fessio, you have published, the great Cardinal Sarah. Yes. And that he has a comprehension of the whole of Western culture in every aspect that we have been discussing today. In fact, a deeper appreciation of it that can be found in <laughs> most of the university faculties and among the intelligentsia and has sounded the toxin a warning absolutely as profound as Benedict XVI. For instance, in his great speech at Notre Dame, shortly before that great fire damaged it so badly. And he speaks specifically of what, I think it was Belgian missionaries brought to the African country in which he was raised. Guinea, yes. In Guinea and, and the positive contributions. Yeah, he was a barefoot boy, not even in a major city, way out in the, you know, the hamlets, the little villages, and the the, the Holy Ghost Fathers came, uh, and they started school there, and his parents became Catholic, and then he was very impressed by these priests praying breviary. He'd go, he see them walking around praying the breviary, their book of prayer, their book of Psalms, and that led to his vocation, and that led to a deeper education, and that led to his becoming, uh, you know, immersed in another culture which did not abolish his culture. He's still African to the core. He's definitely still black, that's for sure. Uh, but what happens, he, he rises to the highest pinnacles of the Catholic Church, a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Where does that happen elsewhere with in inclusivity, you know? And by the way, speaking of, you mentioned this earlier, Bob, Royal, you go into any parish, most typical parishes, even in Virginia there, and you look around, you can't find a more divorced group. You've got rich bankers and, and financial consultants, you've got washerwomen, you've got laborers, you've got young, you've got old, you've got blacks, you've got Hispanics, you've got Vietnamese. I mean, there is no, you know, no grouping you can find more diverse than a normal Catholic parish. Well, I, I think that the equality that is referred to in the American founding is one of those things that can be reached through natural reason. There were hints of it in, in uh, the um, Stoic philosophy and so forth, though it never translated into political institutions at that time. So it's available to natural reason, but on the other hand, there's been no greater exponent of equality than Christianity. Well, here's another example, Bob. The Hippocratic Oath, that's not Christian, that's not Catholic, that's Greek. But who is maintained Hippocratic Oath? It's, you know, when I went to a, a medical graduation a few years back, one of my students was graduating, they had a choice to take, get this, 
the Hippocratic Oath or the Oath of Lasagna? I thought the Oath of Lasagna, what is that? There's some medical professor, you know, uh, named Lasagna, and he created an oath which, which deviates from the Hippocratic Oath. Well, that's what happens when the Hippocratic Oath, which is embedded in a philosophic culture and then a theological culture, is take, try, taken out of it, 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 it degrades. It becomes uh, a host, hostile human, human flourishing. You know, one of the interesting phrases that uh, Ratzinger Benedict used is, you know, he we talked about how he grew up under Nazism. And so he had a, a, a very um, sharp sense of what 20th century ideologies had done. And of course, he, as I mentioned, he was instrumental in replying to liberation theology in its Marxist forms. But because um, there, there are various bad uses of reason or bad forms of reason that exist in the modern world, he said that he... He thought that one of the th the things that those awful experiences of of uh, totalitarianism in the 20th century, and of course we still have it in China and Vietnam and other places in the world right now, those those awful things that happen because of the wrong use of reason or the wrong idea of what reason is, might lead to what he called a convalescence of reason. That because we had a sick reason, we now would have the possibility of seeing that. That, that form of reason led to these things. And therefore, in reaction to that, we might open ourselves up to something that's greater. And, and I think that's kind of in a nutshell why it is that, Bob, I think you rightly say I mean, you can, it's a hard thing to prove, of course, but you could certainly argue that the greatest exponent of reason in its fullest reach uh, in modern times might be Joseph Ratzinger. Well, one of the statements included in the Regensburg address that proved to be incendiary was that acting against acting unreasonably is against God's nature. And to prove that there are different conceptions of God, there were riots and a few murders in the Middle East. They claim were incited by those remarks in the Regensburg lecture. Acting unreasonably is against God's nature. That would, and that, of course, is a reflection of God as as logos, which about which He spoke so powerfully and so movingly. And that reason, Bob, what you referred to, as soon as it's cut off from the transcendent, Benedict sixteen showed it turns inside itself and starts basically disassembling itself, and turns into the irrational but rationality well, is based on irrationality i mean one of the symptoms of ir irrationality uh we haven't talked about this is that the reason i think the primary reason why that regensburg address was misinterpreted is our western media our western media which has a prejudice uh, against the catholic church and also didn't like Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, because of the many things that he stood for that, that opposed this, this dictatorship of relativism that is as powerful in the media as it is anywhere else. I often tell foreigners who have never been to the United States, don't, you know, don't get your ideas of what America is from what the media or Hollywood or, or whatnot tell you that it is. You have to come and actually see what we are. We're a religious people. You know, we're, we, we have our problems like every other people in the world. But when it, I'm not surprised that the Islamic world thought that this was about Islam. This was a, a criticism of Islam. And there, there is a criticism of, of extremist Islam there. But anybody with, with uh, the ability to read or to listen to what the, the discourse was about was, it's primarily about the West. It wasn't at all a, a slap at, at Islam. It was a, a, a kind, it begins with a dialogue between a Byzantine emperor and a Persian uh, um, Muslim. But it moves on to to other things immediately, and it was it's only the Western media who have such a narrow view, uh, you know, based uh, based on po highly politicized and highly polarized political categories, that turned it into something that was almost the, the diametric opposite to what it was about. So it's a well, misuse of reason among our, our our very our very organs of information. I what I found uh, so fascinating about the Regensburg lecture, which I thought was its core. Uh, 
was his concentration on the relationship between faith and reason. And if you don't keep that balance, uh, it, it's very bad things happen. You end up with fideism, uh, which has cut itself off from reason, or you end up with this kind of radical rationality about which you have spoken, which cuts it, itself off from transcendence and, and is therefore no longer reasonable. Let's close and maybe uh, give your final reflections on his legacy. One of my favorite statements, Benedict XVI made extemporaneously when in Rome, uh, a student just uh, shouted a question out at him. And here is, here is what he said. There are only two options. Either one recognizes the priority of reason, of creative reason that is at the beginning of all things and is the principle of all things. The priority of reason is also the priority of freedom or one holds the priority of the irrational inasmuch as everything that functions on our earth and in our lives would be only accidental, marginal, and irrational result, reason would become a product of irrationality. One cannot ultimately prove, prove either project, but the great option of Christianity is the option for rationality and for the priority of reason. This seems to me to be an excellent option, which shows us that behind everything is a great intelligence to which we can entrust ourselves." Unquote. Is that the right? The right That's story? a great place to end. Right he certainly had, a, had a brilliant right. intellect. I mean, he was a man of logos. That's true. But he was logos incarnate in that he was warm, he was friendly, had a sense of humor, he knew culture, he played the piano. So it's not a pure rational reason divorce from every other human faculty. No, it's reason as integrating the rest of man, who then is no longer a fragmentation of his desires and impulses, but rather lives in a life of order. He lived a life of the order of beauty, seems to me. It was a beautiful life. And I just remember, Father Festio, you're telling me about the annual meetings that his former students, including you, would have with him, including when, and also when he was when he became Pope. And I was struck by by your relation of of how he behaved was an expression of such profound humility on his part. Well, I I thought what I just said was my last word, but I'll make this my last word. Okay, my my final, ultimate, last word. He's German, but he's not Prussian. He's Bavarian. And I can see him in his later hosen walking down the town square with the band playing. So I, I call him the universal Bavarian. The universal Bavarian. That's Pope Benedict. Bob, you're closing. My, I'll, I'll give my final last word. If you really read him, there, there's a kind of a wry sense of humor even in his the, the, the most brilliant intellectual yeah. things that he does and what you just read bob reminded me of a remark of his it is it's true but it's also kind of hilarious when you think about it that uh, he says you know over the last couple of centuries in the west we've tried to live uh, even though god doesn't exist that we you know kant and some other philosophers are going to try to develop these ethical systems that even if god doesn't exist we, we would live moral lives and he says, well, if we look back at some of the disasters, the ideologies, the totalitarianisms that came out of that use of reason, maybe we ought to try acting as if God existed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. And I'd like to thank our two guests, Father Joseph Fessio from Ignatius Press and Robert Royal from the Faith and Reason Institute for joining me today to discuss the legacy of Benedict XVI. I invite our viewers to go to the Westminster Institute website or to find us on YouTube where our offerings cover a great range of subjects, including foreign policy, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, China, Japan, Taiwan, uh, the Middle East.
So uh, please join us uh, for that and for our future offerings. And I thank you for being with us today. I'm Robert Riley.